American Top 40. I'm Casey Kasem, and our special countdown this week of the 40 top rock and roll artists of the 50s is just about at the summit. The man at number two, more than anybody else, helped to sell rock and roll to the older generation. His second single was a cover version of Fats Domino's R&B hit, Ain't It a Shame. But he sang it, Ain't That a Shame, and it went to number two. Here's Pat Boone. You made me cry when you said I'm to blame. Fifty-five, Ain't That a Shame, by the second biggest rock artist of the 50s, Pat Boone. You know, that was the period of the big split in American pop culture. Young people took off in a new direction with rock and roll, and the older generation, well, they just kept going straight ahead with their so-called good music. It was Pat Boone who made rock and roll acceptable to a lot of parents who at first objected violently to this terrible new noise that their children were bringing home. When Mom and Dad saw and heard Pat Boone with his white buck shoes and clean-cut good looks singing this awful new music, well, it wasn't so awful anymore. That's right. We have Pat Boone on the Amazing Greats podcast. Hi, Rick Hansen here. And for the first time, we're splitting our podcast interview into two parts, part one and part two. Here is part one with Pat Boone. Wow, what a pleasure we have today as our special guest on Amazing Greats. It's the one and only Pat Boone. Hi, Pat. How are you? I'm doing fine. I, uh, I, you can't, not that it matters a whole lot, but I've had a serious accident in my kitchen. Oh, no. You know, the kitchen and the bathrooms can be the most dangerous places. Yeah. I couldn't do this again if I tried. But I tripped over our dog, Shadow, who's over here looking at me innocently, and fell into a, on a, against a drawer, which had a door, a drawer knob that had enough of a cutting edge that like a can opener, it just cut oh. over a foot long gash in this arm. And so I'm recovering. But fortunately, I can talk without the bandage on. <laughs> Well, you know, I, just a quick aside, because I just had a tripping over the dog story myself. Wow. I was the Walmart parking lot taking my dog for a walk out just to get some fresh air yeah. uh, while my wife was in shopping. And I stumbled over him. He was under my feet, stumbled over him and fell right on my shoulder. These dogs, <laughs> the, uh, not be man's best friend, mass, man's best trip over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but here we are. We're both we're both uh, at it and healthy and ready to roll. So, uh, you know, Amazing Greats is uh, kind of our show is designed around talking with actors, authors, musicians, athletes about their life story and their Christian story. Yeah. And I thought when I was going to connect with you that you would cover most of those, but maybe not the athlete part of it. But yeah. then I did some digging. And I found that you played on the Senior Olympics basketball team for the Virginia yeah, Creepers times. and narrowly missed out on the gold. Yeah. So you're an athlete too. I'm oh, and not only that, but I helped found the ABA, the American, American Basketball Association, and owned the Oakland Oaks the year that we won the championship. And and we instituted the three point play. We created that. I want to get with Steph Curry eventually and say he owes me. <laughs> yes, indeed. Was, the three-point shot didn't exist. I mean, you could shoot from there, but it didn't get three points. But uh, now it's the, it's the it's revolutionized basketball. Yes, it made I it much it, more exciting. Yeah, it made a big part in it. Yeah, I had no idea about all that. So that's we're starting this uh, interview off with some all new information for me, which is okay. great. So let's let's uh, I'm going to just do a quick highlight of your career. Uh, you have sold 45 million records, 38 top 40 songs, appeared in 12 Hollywood movies, hosted your own television series, had a number one best selling book on top of that. And currently in a recently released movie called uh, The Mulligan. So um, and I'm truly, tired. I'm tired. And you're, <laughs> It tired, uh, tired me out just saying all that stuff. Well, so. that, well yeah, I mean, gosh, I'm, 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 I'm got about ten days left in my 88th year, and I've been busy like this my whole life, and going in too many directions at once, interested in everything, insatiably curious, creative, inventive, 
but not the best organized. So I need people to help me get out of the jams I get into. Ah, uh, well, you always got to have support around you for those kinds of things, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So let's start from the very uh, the, the early days. And you've told this story a few times, but uh, I, I just love I've, I've I've seen you tell the stories and I love it is uh, back in the day in the 50s, mid to late 50s. It was there was it was two guys. It was Pat Boone and it was Elvis Presley. Pat Boone was the good guy, all American guy next door. Yeah. And Elvis was kind of a rascal. He was kind of uh, mom and mom didn't want his daughter going out with a, with an Elvis Presley. He looked he seemed that way. Yeah, he was really a good guy. I knew him well. But yeah, we were uh, we were friendly competitors Two Tennessee boys, me from Nashville, him from Memphis. I was born in Jacksonville, Florida. He was born in Tupelo. But but we were Tennesseans. And I fortunately had um, an 11 month head start. On him, I only had I only had six months as age. I was six months older, but but the eleven month head start. In that eleven months, I had six uh, million selling singles. Wow! Two of them number ones, and just before he came out with Heartbreak Hotel. So, it, it, and then we were off to the races. And for the fifties, through the fifties, I had forty one chart records. He had forty. <laughs> <laughs> He was catching up to me in a hurry because but I did have the 11 month head start. However, the first time we met was in Cleveland before he recorded Heartbreak Hotel or anything for RCA Victor. He'd been he'd made one record on Sun Records and he was performing in, in the, the uh, Louisiana Hayride in Shreveport, Louisiana. And they, they would think calling him a rockabilly. He was trying to combine country music with uh, with that new thing called rock and roll. Yeah. But it was hardly called rock and roll then. It was R and B. But he was into R and B music, uh, living in, in Memphis, and I had not been. But now here I was recording uh rock and roll hits, uh, which was R and B. When I met him in Cleveland and it was a sock hop and, and a big DJ brought him in from Shreveport to to get to see him. He was the biggest DJ in the country. So of course, Elvis came in with two of his musicians and I met him backstage at this sock hop in Cleveland where I was the headliner and all, all the kids were waiting to see me and they didn't know who he was. But Bill Randall introduced him as a new kid coming along. And he's going to be making records for RCA Victor. And we want to we want to get acquainted with young Elvis Presley. I had shook hands with him backstage and I said, hi, Elvis, I'm Pat Boone. He said, nice to meet you. I said, um, I said, I, Ed, uh, Bill Randall thinks maybe some big things ahead for you. I don't know about that, but I hope so. <laughs> and then he just leaned back against the wall. His buddies closed in around him. And I, I could tell he was nervous or frightened or just socially, you know, not wanting to talk to somebody he didn't know. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I watched while he went on and he and the boys, they, they lipped or record synced their record of a blue moon of kentucky blue moon of kentucky keep on shining well the kids liked the way he looked but they didn't care for that music uh -huh. it was really it was more country than than rock and then he finished it and they gave him a nice hand i was watching backstage and he said well, thank you very much i liked like to the other side of that record for you hope you like it and that was that's all right mama that's all right with me and that was the b-side of his only record and they loved it and I liked it too. But then when he finished that, he was through and he left. And, and then I got came on and I got all the screams that night because they knew who I was. I had three hit records already and he was gone. And we didn't meet again for about a year and a half when uh, we were both renting homes in Bel Air, California, making movies at 20th Century Fox at oh the same God. time. And I visited with him and he later visited with me. But when I was at his house that night, I said, Elvis, that first night we met in Cleveland, uh, I was worried about you. Why? Why, why, why are you worried? I said, because you seem so nervous and, or shy or something. He said, well, I didn't know how to talk to you, man. What do you mean? Well, you were a big star. I didn't know how to talk to you. I said, a big star. I'd only been recording since March. Yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> said, but you had hit records on the charts and I didn't know how to talk to you. Wow. So that 
that's an evidence of what he was then. He was a nice, somewhat uh, uncertain kid until he got on stage. He knew what to do on stage, although he was nervous then. And I think the twitching and the shaking and all that that he did was an outlet for the nervousness. Interesting. And, and, and when he saw that it made the kids nervous too, but in a good way, yeah. uh, that, that, that became his style, you know. Yeah. But uh, that was our first meeting. And then for the 50s, I matched him record for record. We would knock each other out of first, out of number one with our next record. Match record for record. That's why I say I had 41 chart records. So he had 40. Yeah. But then he took off. And of course, he got over his nervousness, except socially. He was never socially comfortable. He, I mean, he was, he hung out, you know, he's always with his buddies. He lived like public enemy number one, instead of, uh, instead of a giant star, he lived like he, if the public saw him, he, you know, he was trapped. Right. And of course he would have been, I mean, they would have hovered around it, but I had a lot of that myself. And, um, uh, and so that was it. That's the way our two careers took off. And we were, we became very friendly competitors. That is such an incredible story. And what is it about Tennessee? All of these great performers. You've got not only Elvis, but Dinah Shore. Uh, there was Aretha Franklin, Eddie Arnold, Wink Martindale, Dolly Parton, the Allman Brothers. And now even today, it's Justin Timberlake, Miley Cyrus. Yeah. What's going on in Tennessee? Well, it, it, Nashville is called Music City, USA. And throughout the whole South and, and the whole half modern, West, Eastern half the country, I mean, Eastern half, uh, it was it was the town where all the country music performers hung out. Yeah. And uh, and of course, country was getting bigger and bigger all the time. The Grand Ole Opry was uh, on Saturday nights uh, and all across the country and ships at sea uh, emanating from WSM in, in Nashville. And so they had recording studios, great recording producers and and studios. And, uh, and record companies were starting. And uh, my record, Dot Records, where I, where I sold 40 million of those records, was based in Gallatin, Tennessee, just an hour's drive really? out of uh, Nashville. And so it, 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 was, it was really a hub already, but not known so much for pop music as for country. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you had your string of hits included Long Tall Sally, Tutti Frutti, Ain't That a Shame, Speedy Gonzalez, and, thir and 38 and all, right? So yeah. did, did you have a, a, a favorite one that you loved the most or really you felt closest to or was your... your yeah, they, they, it was not so much the rock tunes. Uh, that was, it was the, the 41 records were on dot and that was in the 50s. So they were... They weren't all rock and roll, of course, because during that time, I, I started my own national television show, the Pat Boone Chevy show in 57, midway through the, the last, half, last half of the 50s. So I was singing Tutti Frutti, Ain't That a Shame, Rip It Up, Long Tall Sally, all those songs. But of, of those rock songs, the ones I loved the most were the ballads like Ivory Joe Hunter's I Almost Lost My Mind. When I lost my baby, I almost lost my mind. And it was, it was, there were good ballads. There were some, I did I'll Be Home by the Flamingos. I'll be home, my darling. I mean, I was, I was singing love songs as yes. well. And those, that's what I started out to do. I wanted to be a new Bing Crosby. Instead, <laughs> I don't know what I became. <laughs> I, I became the only Pat Boone who, who recorded has now recorded 2300 songs more wow. than Frank Sinatra. He recorded 1500 Bing Crosby was my idol. He's recorded 2000, but I kept going, just kept going. I mean, I'm in my 65th year of recording. You, sp and, you spent uh, a lot of hours in a studio, right? I did. And I loved it more than anything, more than, more than any other. I mean, I love singing live. I love doing movies. I do love doing, um, uh, the concerts and so on, but, but recording, going in with some musicians and recording something you like, and that has a chance of being a hit that people will want to have, not just buy, but eventually just have as part of their lives. Yeah. That was, it, it was something I was so entranced by and loved it. And I would do stop anything 
for instance, I, after I moved to California, uh, Randy Wood of Dot Records, he had moved his record company to California too. And he called me in the, in the, in the morning, he said, I want you to get to the studio. We're going to record a country song called Moody River. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a country song by Chase Webster about a girl that jumped in the river and drowned because she had been unfaithful to her husband and couldn't live with herself and couldn't tell him. And, and I, I, I didn't really know much what it was, but I, he wants me to come record. So I went to the studio at, at, at about 2.30 or 3 in the afternoon and recorded this song, which I fell in love with. It was a, a melodic, sad song. We intentionally put it in a slightly higher key so I didn't sound like I was singing a love ballad. Moody River, more deadly than the vainest knife. Moody River, your muddy water took my baby's life. And uh, we recorded it for a couple hours. Randy was, I think we got a smash. And so I, I left, left hoping he was right. He took what we called a hot dub. It was a, a, it was a disc taken right off the tape we just recorded. No, no balancing, no EQing, no anything, just the hot dub, they call it. And he went to the number one radio station in L.A., a top 40 station at KFWB, and he knew the program director. Well, I went to a friend's house to pick up my wife and come home for dinner and uh, told her I just recorded a song we thought might be a hit. And. So we're standing in the doorway, my arm around her, and on the radio down low, I hear ba 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 dum ba ba da bum ba dum, and I hear the intro. I said, "Wait a minute!" I turned up the radio. It fortunately it repeated twice. I turned up the radio just in time to hear the DJ say, "And now, for the first time anywhere, KFWB's new pick hit of the week, Pat Boone's Moody River." I was not home from the studio <laughs> recording the song, and it was pick hit of the week already on the radio. <laughs> wow. Those, those were exciting days when program radio stations weren't program programmed by committee. Yeah. They weren't programmed by charts. They were programmed by the DJs who wanted to play them and who thought his listeners might want to hear them. Yeah. Yeah. Just gut feel. Just here's yeah. this sounds like a hit song and they play it. Exactly. They play right. it immediately. Yeah. I had a lot of hits like that. Yeah. That's that was those were the good old days. That was That's the goal. I loved record. recording, you know. Yeah. But during that same time, I, I did the, the big, big band swing with the great arranger, Mort Lindsay, and, who was my conductor on the an arranger on my TV show. And we were doing Frank Sinatra type big band swing, big band and swinging and jumping songs. And then I did the first uh, million selling him album in that same time. Oh, and that's one of the things that gave me the lead over the all the recording the numbers of recording because i was recording a little bit of everything and i knew the teenagers would buy whatever i was recording if it was a page out of the phone book they would have they would have bought it they might not like it <laughs> but but i i had a, the first million selling him album of songs we were all singing in church but which half or more of the teenagers knew nothing about but they bought my million selling him album yeah. And Elvis had it later at Graceland. So so let's just jump back quickly, because I, I want to also jump into where movies became a, a, a part of your life. I remember April Love was, you know, talk about love songs. That was one of the great love yeah. songs of the time. And it came yeah. from a movie of the same name. Yeah, it was um, before me for the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So how did the transition happen? It was just because you were a huge star. They they wanted to put you up on the big screen. Yeah, I, I mean, first I was having hit record after from from March of '55 to till the end of '59. I was always on the charts. I mean, it's a record I hold in the record business that even Elvis didn't have, which was uh, 220 consecutive weeks, four and a half years without ever being off the single <laughs> chart. I was always there. The first time I picked up a Billboard or Cashbox magazine and I couldn't find my record there, it was a shock. I mean, I lived there. But meanwhile, I was recording everything else. And what, so because of that, and because the TV show became a hit, they uh, I was asked by 20th Century Fox to come audition, uh, do a, 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 what do they call it, a, a film test and screen test. So I went out and they liked what they saw and they 
immediately booked me for a seven-year deal, uh, at least one movie a year. Sometimes it was more than that. But and and then right after that, Elvis, he after I made my first movie, Bernadine, and I'm still doing the, the TV show uh, uh, nine months a year. But then three months a, in the summer, I would come to California until we moved out and make a movie or two <laughs> and go back to do it. And I was still in college at Columbia University. Oh, they, my gosh. A whole load. So in 57, I graduated from Columbia University, magna cum laude, with honors. Um, I was on the cover of TV Guide, my cap and gown, because of the show. And... Um, open up the TV guide and there's a picture of Shirley and our four little girls. We had four daughters already at age 23 yeah. and I was making movies, records, television, and sometime finding time to sire four little daughters <laughs> <laughs> and living in New Jersey. So then we moved to California after that. And, and it was Shirley's wonderful wisdom that we, go to California where I could do movies, records, and TV all from one place and where the girls could settle into some kind of hopefully normal life, which we did. And, uh, and so we've lived, in, I'm living in the same house we moved into in 1960. This is where really? I'm not, where I am now. So, so, uh, and you got married to Shirley in, in, when you were 19 years old. Yeah. And somewhere so along the line, I, the there was age. a, there was a bit of, in the early 60s or around 60, 1960, uh, there was some marital situations where you didn't know if it was going to go one way or the other at that point. Well, it was much later than that. No, we oh, were very, very happily married for 10 years at least. Uh, so from from 50, when, when was it? 54, 53? I should remember, but it's been, it's been 60 three 63 years of marriage now anyway so um uh, but in the 60s uh something developed that in her, inwardly she and her we didn't know what it was all she knew was that every time we i tried to be affectionate uh she got nauseous which was sort of a killer you know that's sort of a dampener sure <laughs> yeah i would be <laughs> and, and and she didn't know why and and she said, Pat, I can't, I can't help it, you know? And I, and so I was, I said, let's go to the doctor. She said, no, I don't, I, 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 it'll, I'll get over it. Well, it, for several months, well, at least it was a couple of months before we got her to the doctor. When we got her to the doctor, he found out it was cysts on her ovaries. She had four kids in, in less than four years. That was my fault. And I realized that I was responsible for that. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so I had sympathy after that, but still, for months, uh, she didn't. Uh, she she couldn't. We couldn't. I mean, just holding hands or putting my arms around her, kissing her cheek. Well, after she had the surgery, she was still getting well, but during that time, it, it's something like grew between us, and she she became more irritable with me and my schedule and. I was always so crazy busy and and I was I traveled a good bit because I was doing concerts and just gaps happen that that can happen in marriages. And we we came to a place where we were not sure either of us that we were as in love with each other as we had been when we got married. And, you know, your mind drifts to. Well, what should we do? Well, first of all, we renewed our vows to the Lord, because when I was, I will confess that I was thinking about where could I go? What could I do? Was divorce going to be an answer? And, and surely it was, it, uh, she said she never really considered divorce, but did not know if we could ever regain our love that we had the, uh, the strong affections and the kids could see that we were acting like, um, borders in a boarding house, friendly, nice to each other, but not in love. And no hand holding. We were still going to church regularly and all, but 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 there was something missing. And I, I looked at my four girls and I looked at Shirley, a picture of her with her daddy when she was about three with her arms around her her father's neck. And something just came over me. 
I said, she's still that little girl. Her dad's gone. In fact, he died before we got married. And that's one of the things that brought us together so closely. And then those little girls are, are still little girls. And I'm their only hope for having the wonderful life growing up and the family life that, that I want them to have. It's got to be me, even if I'm not going to be fully satisfied myself. And I, I let Shirley know how that picture of her had moved me. Hmm. And I get emotional telling it because soon after that, it was uh, Father's Day. And she gave me a picture of herself when she was about that age, sitting alone, looking lonesome as a, as a maybe four-year-old by then. And, she, and the, on the back of it, she said, take care of this little girl. She loves you. And at that point, we were susceptible to influences were happening in the church, the, the baptism and the Holy Spirit. And I met a Christian businessman named George Otis, who I called him the electric man. <laughs> he, was, he, he was a business doctor. He was the guy that they, businesses like Magnavox, Lear Industries, and others called in when they were in trouble and might go under. They'd get George Otis to come in and set everything right. I mean, he was that, that uh, amazing as a businessman, but he was also a deeply spirit-filled Christian. And whenever we talked about spiritual things, I noticed that his, that his, his hands got trembly. And, uh, and if, we, if we join hands to pray, I could feel that. And I, so I began to call him the electric man. He wasn't <laughs> over there. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you this, we had a meeting. By the way, I wanted what he had. And I went to his house one night and said, I want this baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so we prayed. And, uh, and I received my baptism speaking in tongues, but not speaking, singing. Because I was, I was, he was saying, look, to, you know, confess your sinfulness. You don't have to go into all the details. Just ask God to forgive you of everything you ever did that displeased him. And, and you'll know that he forgives you if you're honest, you're earnest. I did. Then he says, now thank him, but not in English. And he began to speak in this, this tongue he had. And I was self-conscious. I, I didn't know what I was saying. Thank you, Lord. I really want, he says, not in English. Sing it. He said, sing it. Well, all I knew was to make a note. Ah, 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 And I, a language just fell on my wow. and I, a tune, a Hebraic tune. And I thought, what am I doing singing? That sounds Jewish. <laughs> and I, part of me was standing to the side wondering. And I, I, all of a sudden, I forgot all about wondering. <laughs> <laughs> and I sang like that. It just a rapid language just came singing a melody I hadn't made up. It was just all the Holy Spirit. And it was so refreshing, so wonderful. And I knew it was the Lord. And, and so now it was time to go home. And I said, can I do this in the car going home? He said, sure, you can do it anywhere, anytime. <laughs> just open your mouth and praise the Lord, but not in English. And so I sang in the spirit all the way home. And I told Shirley, and she was thrilled. <laughs> hmm. And uh, and so we we both became spirit filled. Of course, after that, I mean, we we renewed our love for each other as well as for the Lord. But the Holy Spirit made it so deep and so real. And our daughters saw that we were holding hands again, loving each other. Something wonderful. <laughs> Something wonderful had happened. And each of our daughters wanted that same thing. So our four little girls, well, they were two or three of them were teenagers, but Laurie was the youngest who came to us about 10. And she said, Mom and Daddy, can I have what you have? We said, you sure can. It surprised us because we would have started top down from the oldest to the youngest, but it was the youngest. Wow. And she just said, I, I want what you have. And so she received her prayer language like that <laughs> she didn't know what it was but, but it just happened and then cherry the oldest and then lindy and finally debbie who had she was the most like me i wanted to know why what i wanted to know it was real and so she was hesitant so george otis came over <laughs> 
And he went into our guest house to talk with Debbie. She came out singing and speaking <laughs> <laughs> in her prayer lines because you prayer uh, language because you couldn't be with that electric man. <laughs> <laughs> now, wow. we, there's, a, there's a time that happened. If you have time, I'll tell you about being with Ronald Reagan. I'd love it. When, when this was instrumental. And it's, I guess I'm not supposed to say, but don't be surprised <laughs> if you hear that it's in a forthcoming a movie about a president we all love. It's a big budget film and it's yet to come out, but, um, but this scene is in it in which Shirley and I and George Otis and a couple, another minister went up to a Catherine Kuhlman meeting in Sacramento and when, when our friend Ronald Reagan was governor. He and, and Nancy had their kids at the end of their childbearing time. And, and Shirley and I, of course, had really rushed the gun thanks to me and her, her willingness to be my wife. And, um, and so we had our four kids in school at the same school with Ron and Nancy's kids, Ron and Patty. And I got to know Ron when he was no longer in movies. And before he was even body was even thinking about him being governor or holding public office, but he was traveling for GE making what they call the speech with little three by five cards just to, so he wouldn't forget some of the things he wanted to say. And, and a GE loved him. And he was saying things like government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we've got to get the government straightened out government, as he said. Yeah. So, uh, I went to the governor's mansion after we went to a Catherine Kuhlman meeting in Sacramento, Mena, where there was great worship and miracles were happening. Uh, Reagan was not into that, but he was a Christian. So he just said, look, you guys are in Sacramento. Come over to the governor's mansion. Let's have a visit before you go back. So we did this little group with George Otis in it. And he and Nancy gave us tea and we visited. It was late afternoon now, and we were going to go back, go to the airport. And George Otis said, Governor, can we have a word of prayer with you before we leave? <laughs> why, why, sure. And so he, he gave, we joined hands, and George Otis was on his right hand. And I know what Reagan was feeling. <laughs> the vibration. Yes, yeah. the vibration. And, and Harold Bradison, another very spirit-filled minister, was on his other side. And so we started, Shirley and I and, and a couple others, voicing part of a prayer. And it got to George Otis and George starts in his normal voice. He said, thank you, Lord, for all you've done for us. We just praise you, our father, for this country, for our liberties, for this wonderful state and for this governor. And he stopped and there was just a silence. And we wonder what's happened. And then in a different voice, we heard him say, and I know it turned as I portrayed it in the film, he was looking Reagan in the face. But with a different voice, he said, my son, I'm well pleased with you. If you continue to walk before me uprightly, you will dwell at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. Wow. And, and he went back to his regular voice and ended the prayer. And we all looked at Reagan and he was glassy. -eyed. <laughs> he was so the current flowing through him from George Otis to Harold Bradison. And then having this prophecy, which is what it was spoken right to his eyes. I mean, he hadn't had any experience like that. And he didn't, he just said, well, that, that was something. <laughs> it certainly was. And uh, when we portray this in the film and I play George Otis, cause I'm too old to play Pat Boone. There's a young actor and a young actress playing Pat and Shirley Boone in this scene, which is in the film. And uh, so, and so I throw in, in the film, Governor, as George Otis, Governor, those were not my words. I only spoke of what God was telling me to say. It's called a prophecy, a word of prophecy. And he says, oh, oh, and like he didn't. And Dennis Quaid playing Reagan, you know, just said he didn't he didn't know what to make of it. All he knew was that it was startling and it was <laughs> galvanizing. And, and we knew it was the Holy Spirit. So when I went to uh, Sacramento, I mean, to uh, to uh, Kansas City as a Reagan delegate, 
later, I, and I knew he was going to be nominated and elected, but he wasn't. George, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, there you go. Yep. And he, he got the Republican nomination. And so many of us who were in that little prayer and had heard about it, heard the prophecy, thought, well, Reagan will be 70 next time around, and he may not run. And, and, and he didn't want to. But there was, a, this is also in the movie, a scene in which uh, Nancy and the others, his, his kitchen cabinet was trying to convince Reagan to run for a second, a second time. He didn't want to. He said, I did it. I did my best and they didn't want me. And I don't want to go through that again. And she says, you remember that time when that preacher, she said, said that, that, that word in that, when the, I forget how she put it. When in Sacramento, he said, yeah, but you thought he was a crackpot. And she said, well, maybe he was, but maybe it was right. Maybe that's true. Maybe it was true. And that helped convince him to run the second time. Interesting. Because we, know, we know the rest of that. Yes. And there's more to that story about after he was elected, I, I got the news before he did and called him on the phone at Pacific Palisades. I was in Washington hearing Brokaw and, and Jennings uh, and, and the other uh, the other the, the TV anchors uh, saying, it looks like this man, this former governor is going to be our president. They weren't happy about it. And I, and I just took a hunch and this is in the film, called him on the phone and he answered, hello. And I said, may I be the first to refer to you as Mr. President? Well, hello, Pat. I don't know. I, it, it may be a little too premature. They're still counting the vote. I said, I've just heard Broco and Jennings and the, and the other guy, uh, Dan Rather, was it? Dan Rather, yes. Yeah. Say that you are going to be our next president. Do you remember that time in the afternoon when we prayed for you and that word of prophecy came? I thought about it many times in the last few months. And he had, of course. <laughs> and, and of course, it was a word of prophecy. It really happened. And, uh, and it's been written about in a couple of books on Reagan, but it's not common knowledge. But if people go to see this excellent film, when is the film uh, coming know, out? Release date. Do you have any idea? It'll be in the spring. I, I, no, no, I, in the spring I don't. But it'll be. It's it's going to just be called Reagan. Oh. And it'll be. It's a film that really does him justice. And this, these scenes are in that film, and that and they really happened, of course, I, or I wouldn't be telling you about it. You liked it, right? great story. And don't miss part two of the Pat Boone interview on our next episode of Amazing Greats. Hear about his launch of the American Basketball League, his adventures in the world of heavy metal music, and God's plan for his life. Thanks for your time. If you enjoyed this inspiring story of this legend, Pat Boone, please share it with a friend, hit like, and if you like these kinds of Christian stories, go ahead and hit subscribe. Also, you can go to our website at www.amazinggreats.net. Thanks to Clem Daniels for producing our show, and we'll see you back here for part two of Pat Boone on Amazing Greats. <laughs>